We are beginning Esoteric Astrology Adventure number 77, section B. I think I'll confine this to two sections if I can. Sometimes I know I go on for five hours, but it may not be the best thing for downloading. So we've seen, we're discussing Scorpio and its ruler Mars. We are thinking of Mars, first of all, as the ruler of the physical body, but then as the ruler of the entire threefold nature with which a man must uh, contend when he becomes a disciple. The, the personality itself becomes the dweller on the threshold, his powerful threefold uh, integrated mechanism, summing to the number four. So there is the four of opposition, and there is the four of harmonization. And the man is, in a way, struggling between the two fours. It kind of suggests the number eight, in a way. And the higher of the circles must dominate the lower. Secondly, it tells us here on page 211 that Mars is closely related to sex, which is an aspect of the pairs of opposites. And its effect is also definitely to vitalize the bloodstream. So Mars is related to sex and also um, Mars is related to the vitalization of the bloodstream. All of these ideas go together. The um, stimulation of the blood, especially in relation to sex, and the power of Mars to make the heart pump faster uh, as is necessary in the various kinds of conflicts undertaken. Mars, in a way, is a representative of the sun through the solar plexus. The sun is the source of pranic vitality, the great vitalizer, and Mars is its agent. Uh, it, Mars, purifies and stimulates all aspects and organisms in the body via the bloodstream. So we see the importance of Mars in relation to the sustainment of our vitality. It purifies, it vitalizes, purifies, and stimulates all aspects and organisms in the body. So when we think about the first law of healing, that um, disease is the result of inhibited soul life, it fails to flow through the aggregate of organisms which constitute any particular entity. We see that Mars is very much involved in promoting this vital flow and how this ruddy planet is involved with what we call our uh, rude and ruddy health. The Tibetan would like to see a lot more of that kind of health, the natural type of health, natural to, he says, the South Sea Islanders, again, express itself through modern man, who has been largely devitalized. This aspect of Mars, related to activity, to exercise, to the uh, powerful use of the various aspects of the body, this has gone on the wane when it comes to many individuals in our Western society. But since this book was written, there has been a, a regaining of this approach towards health through exercise, which is a very uh, Martian, I would say, approach. Also, Mercury is involved because activity is involved and intelligence is involved. So the uh, power of the blood is related to Mars and the power of the blood to bring health to the organisms in the body is related to Mars. It will be obvious to you, therefore, how the tests in Scorpio and the activity of Mars are potent to arouse the entire lower nature 
and bring about its final rebellion and the last stand, so to speak, of the personality against the soul. I think these are really words to contemplate, potent to arouse the entire lower nature and to bring about the final rebellion or last stand. This idea of a final battle is so very Martian. And in a way, that aspect of Mars simply has to be overcome. The Mercury-Venus soul is that which overcomes this aspect of Mars. And I suppose, despite our best intentions, we have found aspects of our nature and sometimes our entire integrated self standing against our higher incentives. The empowered lower nature is a formidable opponent and the only way we can conquer it, and Vulcan is involved as well in this conquest, is through identifying as the soul and no longer identifying as the personality. So it is Mars who brings the world Arjuna into the active fight. There's oftentimes a hesitation to really fight against what is uh, comfortable, comfortably expressed in our nature. There are so many instincts and tendencies which we would perhaps like to continue in their original form, but we are aroused in our discipleship nature as the world Arjuna to choose sides and to fight on behalf of our higher nature with which we now identify against the long familiar nature ruled by uh, the lower aspect of Mars. The whole man is then engaged in the quarrel of the sexes and the quarrel of the sexes is resolved in its highest aspect through the battle between the highly developed personality or form nature and the soul, which seeks to be the ultimate controlling factor. There is much in the disciple of a Martian nature, but really the entire personality is ruled by Mars, and in this case, Venus Mercury rules the soul, and Venus must prevail. The disciple has much of Mars in his nature as he undertakes this battle, but increasingly fights with the clarifying intuitive power of Venus Mercury over the uh, brute force of Mars as it works through the personality demanding the expression of the instincts and of the uh, lower ego. So we don't win this battle via Mars, per se. <clears throat> Mars brings us into the engagement. And the battle of the sexes, the quarrel of the sexes is undertaken. We're all involved in that. But in a way, it's a higher aspect of the divine feminine, which is to prevail in this uh, aspect of the battle. Later, again, the masculine will assert itself under the mm, aegis of the monad. But for the moment, it is the Venus-Mercury power of the soul, which is to prevail over the quarrelsome Mars. And there's no way we can avoid this battle. We cannot run from it. We sometimes do that in Libra. We wish to preserve the status quo. We wish not to be engaged in unpleasantness. That's a certain a tendency, a Venusian tendency in Libra, but it's not the highest tendency. We have to engage in this life or death battle. It's really a battle for our spiritual life. So I don't think there's one among us 
who does not find himself or herself engaged in this conflict. And it says the whole man is then engaged. And we noticed how Mars, in that sense, rules the entire personality until there really is a completely integrated personality, empowered, capable. This final quarrel of the sexes or this battle of the sexes cannot enter its final phase and be resolved definitely in favor of the soul. There may be minor victories here and there, but the major victory, uh, an aspect of the major victory has to occur at the third initiation when the ancient domination of the personality is ended. The ancient authority of the personality is ended. The color assigned to Mars is, as you know, red. Red is a color assigned also to the will and to the first ray, the esoteric color, interestingly. So red has some fairly low expressions having to do with the physical body and with the uh, blood appearing on the physical plane and also with some of the highest aspects of spirit and it will characterize the solar system to come, the red system, we are told. The color assigned to Mars is, as you know, red, and this is a correspondence to the color of the bloodstream, and hence also uh, the association of Mars with passion, with anger, and the sense of general opposition, you know, fighting against that which would unify, against that which would harmonize. And Mars is initially a divisive force. It uh, fights on behalf of the part at first, rather than the whole. But then, of course, it can be guided by Vulcan, it can be guided by the will, the true spiritual will, and then it becomes instrumental in fighting for a larger unity. When the Mars is serving the lower ego, it is indeed divisive. We can see how a Mars and Leo combination could mean that. Mars and Leo, on the other hand, could be extremely heroic on behalf of soul vision and soul identification. So the bloodstream itself is associated with passion and anger. They talk about a person uh, entering that phase when his blood is up, so to speak. And the heart beats faster and the blood circulates and the adrenaline is secreting. And this is the fight stance, fight or flight. But the, uh, the blood is definitely involved with the general uh, sense of fight. It's hard when the heart is simply pumping in the normal way or even quietly to enter into a battle, to enter into a contest, <clears throat> to be involved in athletics, which always involve uh, some sort of contest with others or with oneself attempting to achieve one's personal best. So, but at least engagement is brought about. And rather than relay, uh, remain unrelated, various factors which at first cannot be harmonious are at least brought into engagement with each other so that an eventual harmony can be achieved. Mars uh, governs the path towards Venusian unity and harmony and towards the Mercurian reconciliation uh, connected with the Buddhic play. But first, the battle. The sense of duality is extremely powerful in relation to this planet. And I think you see that in many sixth ray people. Mars uh, expressing the sixth ray they just don't see the other person's point of view. They are entirely identified with their own point of view, and they are willing or even driven to fight until the point of view with which they identify prevails. So, in today's world, it's my religion over your religion. 
There can be only one true religion and it must prevail. We've seen this in Christianity during the period of the Crusades. We're seeing this now in relation to Islam. We don't see it so much in relation to Buddhism, which has a stronger mental component, it seems. And maybe, uh, I suppose there are fanatical Hindus, I suppose there are fanatics in all the various religions, especially religion today with its strongly sixth ray bias, the recrudescing sixth ray being so prominent before it goes out. So the sense of duality, uh, we see it in political parties and various ideologies, my ideology over yours, Republicans, Democrats, <laughs> socialists versus capitalists, you know, only seeing their own point of view. And guided so much by Mars, led into battle with the apparent opposite through Mars and not seeing, as the fourth ray can see, that the two really are one, two merge with one, not seeing that yet. The sense of duality is exceedingly powerful. This is what we must overcome. It was so strong in World War I and II, so strong in previous wars, but I think people are becoming tired of the strictly Martian aspect of war. A greater win-win situation has now to prevail in this uh, age in which technology has revealed the one humanity in the one world where you can be anywhere in the world in less than a day where you can that's that's in person and where you can project your presence your voice your image instantaneously to any part of the world to anyone the ancient separative martian methods no longer seem to apply so where Mars is found in our horoscope, we may emphasize a certain sense of duality which has to be bridged and overcome and somewhat ameliorated, let's say has to be civilized, because Mars represents the barbaric forces, which is kind of interesting, kind of the beard-growing forces. The barbarians were called those who sport the beard. And those barbaric tendencies have to be spiritually civilized. Hence, also, the necessity for the entire life of man, for the blood is the life, in this sense, to be swung into the conflict, the entire life of man. This is especially in the Scorpio experience. All aspects have to engage in the battle, and all aspects have to be tested, whether they will go their own way or whether they will serve a higher and more spiritual will, a higher master. When the blood is up, all aspects of the man are swung into the conflict and the lower personality organizes its forces and directs them uh, in the spirit of opposition against the civilizing forces. So all aspects have to be swung into the conflict, leaving no side of human nature uninvolved. And we can think of this in a simple way. The body is involved, the vitality is involved, the emotions are involved, the mind is involved. The sense of being a unique individual, a lower ego, is involved. And the battle really is on. Before that, there may be minor skirmishes, but this is a decisive battle. I was um, just studying the Civil War in America, and there were certain battles which were the absolute turning points of the war. We could consider the Battle of Gettysburg to be such a point. There were huge losses on both sides, but basically the, the South representing the solar plexus and lower centers uh, below the Mason-Dixon line, which uh, represents the diaphragm of the United States. The loss was greater for them, and uh, the war turned at that point. Many were still the bloody battles and huge losses. But after that point, uh, there was uh, an inevitability 
to the victory of the higher chakras of the United States. Uh, and uh, they're at least um, prevailing, their, their sense of prevailing over the lower chakras. Although, you, you know, if the higher chakras uh, simply dominate the lower, you have all kinds of disease possible. And this is not what was desired, and I don't think it is what happened. So a great rebellion occurs. And it's interesting that the southern forces had a tremendous elan. They had a dash. They had a panache. They had a, a Martian a heroism, certainly at first. And they were called rebs, uh, rebel, rebels. It was a very strong Martian uh, rebellion against the factor of synthesis and of course, Lincoln and the North were coming in with industrialization and more the power of Vulcan, the spiritual will. And in a way, a Vulcan dominated Mars, as inevitably it must if things are to go well. One cannot imagine a United States in which slavery persisted beyond those years. It would be a tremendous anachronism. At some point, slavery would have to be defeated, and that was the decisive battle when a, an avatar of humanity in the form of Abraham Lincoln uh, guided the power of synthesis over the power of secession, the separative aspect of Mars. So anyway, we experienced this microcosmically and nationally and macrocosmically. No side of human nature is uninvolved. And the blood mobilizes all aspects of human nature, and they are swung into a focused rebellion against the integrating forces. I think we see this in politics at present. You know, In the battle between, uh, you know, of course, there are abuses of capitalism and abuses of uh, socialism. No, nothing is perfect, but... The Aquarian Age is, I think, an age of enlightened socialism, not the uh, kind of socialism which relegates all members of society to kind of a dull gray sameness, but a socialism which calls forth the talents of all and encourages their expression and truly socializes man so that all of his contributions are for the welfare of society and the welfare of all that are involved in society. And we have in capitalism kind of a, I mean, you know, initiative is tremendously important, and there must be that in the socialistic approach as well. Anything that kills initiative, human initiative, is wrong. But we have kind of the lone wolf attitude, I'll grab all I can, I'll compete, and I will excel at the expense of others. So some of the capitalistic mentality uh, goes along that line. And I think we can clearly see the uh, opposition of Mars to a more Venusian, Jupiterian, Vulcanian, inclusive attitude. Little digression. So hence again, the need for the disciple to carry his physical nature, his emotional or desire nature, and his mental processes up into heaven. And we're going to learn that uh, Mercury is the heavenly planet in one way. It's uh, one of the heavenly planets. It's a lower octave of the heavenly one, which is Uranus. But all of these processes have to be reoriented towards the higher mind and eventually towards the cosmic ethers so that all of them become expressions of still higher forces, uh, no longer the expressions merely of the lunar nature and its instincts. This is how the battle is won and there's a certain updrafting uh, magnetism with Mercury attracting towards the buddhic plane when all is, where all is seen harmoniously related. 
So this is the battle that all of us human beings are involved in, and every one of us individually. We're involved in one phase or another of the battle, maybe working in one vehicle or another, depending upon our initiatory grade, but eventually we'll be involved in the final battle when the entirety of our nature is uh, rising in rebellion, must be subdued and eventually carried up into heaven. And our elemental life becomes Davic at that point, and we become free of the elementals and become at last initiates of the fourth degree. Nothing final about that, it's just one more liberating step upon the seemingly endless way. So um, we're carrying uh, our physical nature, our emotional nature, emotional desire nature, our mental processes up into heaven, or at least subjecting them to heavenly influence so that they are guided by heavenly influences rather than by instinctual egoic forces, lower egoic forces. This takes place as a consequence of overcoming the serpent of evil, the 666 in this sense, which is Mars again. There's, there's your number, 666, the serpent of evil. The form nature with its promptings and demands, its lower separative impulses, promptings and demands. I was interested in, in how uh, Abraham Lincoln, even at the beginning of the Civil War, asked all to somehow respond deliberately to our better angels, to our better angels, you know, somehow an allusion, I think, to the solar angel. Of course, uh, no one really did. <laughs> but later, there was a restatement of that idea, and the possibility of responding to the better angels again uh, emerged. So we do have this serpent of evil. This is sin. This is the 666. This is really Mars. The united power of the lower serpent to uh, withstand and oppose and rebel against the civilizing forces of the soul, the spiritually civilizing forces of the soul. So the overcoming of the serpent of evil by the means of the serpent of wisdom which is the esoteric name oft given to the soul. Serpent of evil, serpent of wisdom, lesser dragon of wisdom, that's a master. And finally, a true dragon of wisdom, that's a planetary logos. And then a lion of cosmic will, that's the solar logos. Seems that we've transferred then from the serpent into the lion, but the whole serpent mythology is uh, intensely significant. And we have to, the, the, the soul itself uh, can appear in serpentine form. And the fiery beings may appear like flame, like undulations, serpent-like this waving motion, which is at once uh, reminiscent of the sinuosity of the third ray, but also the duality of the second, uh, is found uh, in relation to all serpentine demonstrations. In any case, we have to become the serpent of wisdom. You know, when the serpents were driven out of uh, Ireland by St. Patrick, I don't know if it was such a good thing. I mean, I know the the tide was against them, and the sixth ray age was coming in, and they represented perhaps in their druidical priesthood more the seventh ray. But now the return of the serpents is occurring. I St. Patrick, I guess, wouldn't be happy. <laughs> All of the celebration of the ancient seventh ray ritualistic modes have returned to the Celtic areas. And perhaps after the idealism of the sixth ray has uh, reoriented man, as it has during the last 2,000 years, a better use of the magical serpentine processes will begin to occur. It's, it's so interesting how uh, Christianity 
is always fighting the serpent without realizing that serpents and dragons can be very uh, wonderful forces of wisdom and higher power. So it's as if uh, to the Christians all serpents are evil serpents and St. George has to kill the evil serpent. Well, I guess we all have to kill the evil serpent or at least take the power of this serpent and lift it up into heaven and commit it to a higher, uh, higher objective. But we need to redeem the image of the serpent, redeem the image of the dragon. Well, that's being done too in the films and the media. A new type of consciousness is coming in with the seventh ray, which is somehow elevating the dragon into a noble creature and all kinds of lore about the sacrifices of the dragons is emerging. And of course, the serpent sacrifices of the solar angels, the sacrifice of our planetary logos, the dragon of wisdom, the sacrifice of the masters, the lesser dragons of wisdom, these are emerging obliquely into human consciousness. In connection with the symbolic connection between Mars and the blood, producing the resultant conflict between life and death, where Scorpio is one of the signs of death, it is interesting to note that Christianity is governed by Mars. Well, you know, maybe one wouldn't think that, but it, at first, when we think about the so-called gentle sufferer, Jesus as the gentle sufferer, but you know, DK tells us that Jesus is a militant figure, a great general. After all, he was Joshua, who engineered the Battle of Jericho, who commanded that. Whether or not we agree with the motives uh, of that battle and uh, contemporary battles for the promised land, so-called promised land, Jesus is a Martian figure. And I guess he met, in a way, a very Martian destiny in the crucifixion, kind of a culmination of his military past. But the Christ is his great ideal, and the second ray, therefore, is his great ideal, whatever this means in terms of his particular ray structure. seems to have a lot of six and one, but who is to know what the very highest aspect may be? You know, the monadic ray, as I've tried to explain, at least my theory about it, is dual. And one aspect of it can be any one of the seven rays, but uh, the highest aspect of the monadic ray has to be the ray one, two, or three. And is, I think, connected with the logoic plane rather than the monadic plane per se. So who is to know what is the very highest ray of some of these uh, great masters? So we are, you know, trying to emerge out of the militancy of Christianity. I think it is happening. And the more uh, universal religion of love and wisdom that the Christ, the great second ray, master of all masters, will bring, is quite different from this militancy propagated by Paul, a very Martian figure, and uh, Muhammad, uh, apparently a disciple of the Master Jesus, a very Martian figure, born, Alice Bailey says, uh, in the sign Aries. So Mars may have run its course in relation to certain of the contending religions, not quite yet upon the physical plane, but its destiny is to run its course as the sixth ray is withdrawn. About life and death, well, we hope it's not the life of the personality and the death of the soul. It's oftentimes the death of the personality caused by the livingness of the soul, which begins to dominate the ancient lunar Martian tendencies. So it's the death of the form which uh, inhibits the full expression of soul consciousness. That's what this life and death battle is all about. 
and so often it does involve spilling of blood. Uh, the way of the six ray lord is red with blood, and his fellow ray lords ask him why it is so. They call him a beloved enigma. Um, he's a beloved enigma to the other six ray lords. His way is red with blood. And in the war, so much blood has been spilled for the separative ideals that are nurtured by the sixth ray. So onward Christian soldiers, you know, raising the cross militantly. This is what Christianity has done, and I wonder now about the karmic result. As now yet another militant religion pursues those who were militant in the past. Well, all this is in the hands of the great Shohan on the sixth ray, Jesus, Master Jesus, and it is for him, aided by those who can aid, to find the way of uh, producing an inclusive idealism which unites the best aspects of the rapidly fading old forms of these militant religions until they morph into a new form which is much more characterized by the universality, the Aquarian universality of the second ray. One is apt to recognize with ease that the sixth ray working through Mars rules Christianity. Well, maybe some of that glamour died out in World Wars I and II. It was interesting in the Civil War how many people were eager to sign up and fight, you know, as if it would all be over in 90 days. That same attitude seemed to persist even in World War I. There was such a polarization. And as the Tibetan says, great hatred. Less hatred, apparently, uh, in the com uh, combating forces of World War II. So they were eager uh, to go out into the field of battle and prove themselves, uh, led on by a certain sense of inevitable victory, almost as if it was a game. In the very first battle of the Civil War, the Battle of Bull Run, the people from Washington, as Washington was quite close to the battlefield, just came out as if for a picnic and to uh, see the battle and see their side win, almost like going to some sort of sports event. And of course it was a real rout, it turned out to be a rout. The northern forces lost, and the carriages and wagons that had come out to see their side win became entangled with the retreating soldiers, and it was a real mess. But there are many high-minded glamours uh, about the glory of war, but then war is hell is perhaps a more realistic understanding of the actual battlefield processes. Just read about Stalingrad and you'll see that it is so. So anyway, he says we should recognize with ease that the sixth ray working through Mars rules Christianity. <clears throat> it is a religion of devotion. Okay, the sixth ray of devotion and idealism, fanaticism, undue emphasis of one's own perspective and point of view and beliefs and creeds, of high courage, which is typically Martian, you know, facing all odds for the sake of one's belief, of idealism, the ideal of Jesus in this case, and the triumphant church universal of the spiritual emphasis upon the individual and his worth and problem. Not so group-oriented except perhaps the great family of Christ, sometimes emphasized, but the struggles of the individual with sin, with his own lower nature, with the devil prompting him, with the, the 666 prompting him. Christianity has emphasized this. A 
I think we also have to learn to emphasize the struggles of the group, the worth of the group, the problem of the group, and the personality of the group as it must be overcome courageously for the sake of the higher soul ideal. And sometimes, as with the martyrdom of groups of people uh, who are resisting enemies, uh, this has been emphasized. But this kind of uh, tremendous intensity of Christianity and of other militant religions, um, I think they're giving way to a calmer, saner, more unified approach to spirituality and to reuniting with the higher forces. There are still vestiges of this and recrudescences and they will slowly fade probably after some climactic revelation of their worthlessness in the present conflict. So uh, this is DK's assessment of Christianity. A religion of devotion, fanaticism, high courage of idealism, of spiritual emphasis upon the individual and his worth. So in a way, it's not totalitarian there. It is um, not attempting to regiment all people, although I'm, there have been totalitarian applications. Um, But the, the struggles of the individual are prominent. The problem to be overcome. Conflict with sin, death unto life. All these characteristics are familiar to us in the presentation of Christian theology. I guess we realize, you know, written 80 years ago this was, how much it has faded to a degree. I mean, there are places, let's say in the United States, the heir to the sixth ray, heir to the Piscean civilization, and with a strong emphasis upon the sixth ray through its personality where this is emphasized, and other places, but we can see it fading out, feel it fading out in the general Aquarianization of approach to the divine. Even with the uh, tremendous uprising of Islam at this point, uh, it is on the sixth ray primarily, and it too, uh, in light of the revelations of the future, will be necessarily uh, transforming or its old aspects fading out, I suspect. It is, however, preeminently a religion which has waged a cruel and oft illogical war upon sex and its implications. This is not true uh, of some of the other six-ray faiths. They perhaps overemphasize um, and legitimize uh, beyond uh, balance the sexual factor. <clears throat> It is, however, preeminently a religion which has waged a cruel, Im imposed from above, oft illogical, because it doesn't really make sense if the perpetuation of the race is to go forward, upon sex and its implications. I suppose the, uh, the idealism <clears throat> which would have one reach heaven at all costs, um, wars against the binding uh, aspects of sex and the way in which it uh, attaches one to people, to persons, to family, to the physical plane. In other words, not to heaven. Other groups have carried sex into heaven. None of this seems to be accurate, at least according to the words of, uh, of the Christ. Because marriage as we experience it here, is not um, found in the heaven worlds. 
So it has em emphasized a militant uh, a celibacy, militant where women and their rights and natures are concerned. So there is a kind of a wry comment by the Tibetan talking about uh, the sexual, uh, let's call it here, the sexual license of, uh, whoops, sexual license of the male members of these groups, uh, of the men in these groups, and the restrictions placed upon women. And we see that today. We do. Uh, in various of these six ray groups. Um, in any case, it's not a balanced approach, by no means. And this imbalance is going to be corrected under the Libran aspect, which is growing so strongly in our planetary chart, <clears throat> the Tibetan tells us, and also um, which is intimately related to the air sign emerging into prominence, that is, <clears throat> Aquarius. So this wry comment, pointing out something that many male members of these faiths will not acknowledge, that there has uh, been the enforcement of a militant celibacy, but we all know that the, a number of popes have had many children. <laughs> and, you know, many priests have their struggles, and as Blavatsky pointed out, uh, Infanticide was common in various of the convents and the remains of these children unwanted are found in the vicinity of the convents. So there's a whole underside to this whole scorpionic uh, issue of sex and religion. So those aspects of Christianity, I think, are, are now fading out, and thus it must be with all distortions and imbalances in these various militant six-ray six religions. It has regarded the sex relation as one of the primary evils in the world. Now, there's the illogic of it, you know. I mean, it's really based upon world hatred. Kicking the ball of earth, as the six-ray lord tends to do despising uh, life upon the physical plane. But if uh, life here is part of God's plan and uh, creation on the physical plane is important, then how can sex be a primary evil? Hence the illogic of that position. It has regarded the sex relation as one of the primary evils in the world and has laid the emphasis upon the inviolable nature of the marriage bond when endorsed by the church. It's a way, I suppose, of especially keeping women in control, under control, and giving the church tremendous authority over the individual promptings which arise in the human nature, whether for good or for ill. <clears throat> whether these are moral promptings and attractions, or whether they are uh, immoral and uh, based upon instinct rather than upon love, um, the church still remains preeminent. So the church is always the authority, and interestingly enough, the Catholic Church, uh, the Church of Rome, which became the center, the concentrated power of Christianity is ruled by the first ray. I'm not sure exactly how that worked in the Byzantine Church, but um, the first ray and the third ray are respectively the soul and personality rays of the Catholic Church. So the power complex <clears throat> is very strong. Keeping people in line and making the church the final authority in all questions of human relation. This has all been the result, says the Tibetan, of the beneficent or the maleficent effect of the impact of sixth ray force upon the form nature. Because in a way, you know, to restrain the strictly physical aspects of sex may not be a bad thing. A higher ideal then would control, and the church would be the 
uh, the center of authority for the expression of that higher ideal. So DK does uh, include the word beneficent, acknowledging that some good things have come of this, but also malefic. Mars is considered one of the malefic planets, along with Saturn, and the sixth ray passes through Mars. And of course, uh, a ray is not strictly of the form. A ray conditions the form and drives it in certain directions and causes various <clears throat> reformations in the world of form. So all during this last 2,000 years, there has been quite an impact of the sixth ray upon the form nature, restraining it in many ways, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but the cruel and illogical restraint, which D.K. says uh, the Catholic Church was, uh, was guilty of, was not wise. And the sixth ray oftentimes will express much zeal, but not a great deal of wisdom. Little emphasis has been laid, nevertheless, upon the influence of Mars upon Christianity. Uh, I guess uh, in the ideal of the people when considering Christianity, its warlike nature has not been emphasized. Little emphasis has been laid, nevertheless, upon the influence of Mars upon Christianity, making it a definitely militant religion, often cruel and sadistic, as witness the murders and tortures carried out in the name of Christ, who was the outstanding representative of God's love. So here we have the uh, Black Lodge <clears throat> influence. Uh, inverting Christ's intentions. That the great representative of God's love should be represented by murdering, torturing religion, at least in its most fanatical, <clears throat> among its most fanatical followers. A huge contradiction there. and uh, <clears throat> unspeakably cruel. The second ray is not capable of that type of cruelty. It is not sadistic. It has a strong power of identification with the other, but the, the uh, dualism promoted by Mars and the sixth ray make cruelty and sadism possible. Um, one has only to go to the Spanish Inquisition particularly <clears throat> to see this uh, mercilessly <clears throat> at work, uh, carrying out apparently God's will, but really the uh, evil aspect of man projected upon God as if it were God's will, which obviously it was not. <clears throat> Throughout the teaching of Christian theology, the theme of blood runs ceaselessly and the source of salvation is laid upon the blood relationship and not upon the life aspect which the blood veils and symbolizes. So here is a relationship astrologically between Mars and Neptune. Neptune representing the life aspect and the Christ, um, the true Christ, and Mars representing the blood relationship the water of life, Neptune, in relation to Aquarius, and the blood of life, which is Martian, more related to the Master Jesus, who actually was forced to spill his blood, was not the Christ in this incarnation, that particular incarnation, whose <clears throat> blood was spilt, but that of the Master Jesus, a more militant figure, <clears throat> taking a high, though relatively lower, initiation than the Christ. So um, the emphasis upon the dead Jesus has to be changed. It is the creed of a crucified and dead Christ which rules Christianity and not that of the risen master. I mean on, at Easter his rising is celebrated but through so much of the remainder 
of the year. It is the suffering of uh, Jesus, which is emphasized and consequently the suffering of all followers of Jesus. One of the reasons for this travesty of the truth, goodness, the Tibetan is very direct, isn't he? has been that St. Paul, that great initiate, prior to taking, maybe the great initiate now, I suppose, prior to taking the third initiation, which he did at the time he was functioning as related in the Acts of the Apostles, so we can read there what he wrote during this expression, the Acts of the Apostles, to see what it is to be passing through the third initiation, was potently under Martian influence and was born in Scorpio. He was a Scorpio. Under Martian influence. With a very prominent sixth ray, I suppose. Sometimes I've thought that St. Paul was, after all, a sixth ray soul who transferred to being a second ray soul, though his monad was on the fifth and first rays. So he emphasized the Martian approach and not the Neptunian approach. It was a persecutory approach. He was potently under Martian influence and was born in Scorpio. A study of his horoscope, huh, could we but have it, would demonstrate this were you in a position to study as can we, who are connected with hierarchy. Well, thus the incentive is held out for all astrologers. <laughs> okay. I want to write that. Incentive for all astrologers. It was he who gave the Scorpio Mars slant to the interpretation and exposition of the Christian teaching and deflected its energy into channels of teaching which its founder had never intended. Oh, goodness. Such is the often the undesirable effect of the activity of well-meaning disciples upon the work which they undertake to carry on after the originator of some work for the hierarchy passes over to the other side through death or relinquishes his task in order to take up other duties. This is a cautionary note. So, let us be warned. As we, well-meaning, attempt to do the good and may, in fact, deflect the intention of our superior. Well, this will be the end. Uh, I'll come back to this just a little bit, but the end of EAA 77. And I suppose... Um, <clears throat> We are on page 213. Okay. Uh, B. <clears throat> and uh, page 213. So we'll come back to this. We're in an area which has been so um, prominent in the life of Western man because the Christian religion has been so... Uh, dominant in the Western world. And, as I say, other six-ray religions such as Islam are said to be offshoots of this, so we're looking at one basic expression along the six-ray line. But let us close then with the sounding of the uh, great invocation. And let's see if we can... Okay, I think that's not so good. This is better. And we'll sound this together. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh, oh.
Okay, friends, we will continue with um, esoteric astrology adventure number 78. There have been made, uh, you know, well, well more than 80 of these uh, one-hour presentations. Some of them have been two, three, four, five hours. And hopefully we will be back on track here and uh, making our way through the book, this marvelous book. I'm just giving you my associations as these words impact my consciousness at its present level of unfoldment. And hopefully some of these thoughts will be stimulating to you and will help you weave uh, a sense of greater wholeness uh, when you confront this new uh, astrological presentation. The Mercurian links hopefully will be somewhat made and will stimulate links that you will be making and new links that you see. So we'll come back and uh, we'll come back shortly and continue.